Hello and welcome to another episode of Similarly Different. On today's episode, I have a new friend that I've come across my path of life and also somebody that is a very big reason of why I'm even doing this podcast. Do you have the sound effects? <laughs> yeah. I'll do it myself. <laughs> Hello, mister. Hello. Can you please introduce yourself to the world? Yes, yes. My name is Kavanaugh James and thank you for having me on today. I'm excited to chat. Yes, I love everything that I have heard thus far about <laughs> who he is whether it be on social media or just from conversations and when we were planning the preparation of this podcast i was like i need to have him on because i just love the way you think the way you speak the way you articulate your thoughts and i Mm. think that it'd be a great conversation that's so kind of you to say i felt the same way when we met i feel like that's why it was like a natural fit for us to even have this convo but like to find a working kind of partnership Mm -hmm. i think that that's the fun thing of getting to know people and just going to random meetings or lunches i remember meeting you that day and being like oh i instantly as soon as we left i remember chatting with courtney and was like, oh my goodness, Yanina has so much on her. And when I say on them, I feel like that thing that I really respond to is like the potential and that underneath the surface bubbling thing that someone has, which mm-hmm. you clearly have in space. boiling water. Yeah, it's like, well, okay, so what are we going to turn this into? Like right. we have momentum to be able to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And then now is this person, do they have vision for where they're wanting to go? Can we partner? Yeah. It's fun. Love that. And you're just so animated. <laughs> animated. And even he'll be explaining something normal and he just puts so much life into it and then out of nowhere like I was telling him earlier I saw a video of him hiking and I'm like it's a whole experience when you're hiking with him even if you're not with him you would feel like you're there because of the way he's explaining it so I love that but on today's episode I wanted to talk about our 20s Oof. and don't like, we all have something yeah, to say about our 20s that's the thing I feel like the 20s everybody can talk about it's either fun traumatic a or little bit of both, both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it so. should be. I feel like that's what they're for, right? Yeah. Aren't we supposed to have each decade be defined by how we actually move through that space and mm-hmm. how it propels us to the next point in life? I think the 20s are important. They're so important. And I think that when you're experiencing the 20s or even going into your 20s, you get told by so many people, have fun. But I don't know, you can tell me about yourself. But for me, mm-hmm. I was like, fun. Exactly. I need to get my life together. <laughs> There's so much stress in mm-hmm. our own mind because now we went from high school school and all this stuff Mm -hmm. and just like a very more flex life even if it was serious like let's say you were the studious person it was still your responsibilities weren't that big and it hits you once you get out of high school and you start Mm -hmm. going into college that you're like oh now I have bigger responsibilities and you think that life is about to come crumbling down if you don't have it all figured out of course yeah so (laughs) it's so true where were you in your 20s oh goodness I was all over the place I was in college I went to school in Texas and was getting my marketing degree um, in my 20s then I moved to New York and thought that I was supposed to be acting and I was auditioning for Juilliard and doing like pounding like talented talented I don't know about that, but I mean... <laughs> to be able to even audition to Juilliard, like, come on. Well, that's kind of, I've always loved performing and kind of the community of mm-hmm. creatives, which I first kind of got into that through theater. And so mm-hmm. I was trying to find out where... I belonged in that space. At the same time, I was spending a great deal of my 20s doing artist support, which is what I would kind of define as being able to live in other people's kind of mountaintop moments in their life and really Mm -hmm. support them there in health. And I think that your 20s can feel like you've said, like this kind of time where you're supposed to just be like already thriving and in the Mm -hmm. center of, you know, you graduate college and then you enter into your career. And that just doesn't happen for everyone. And so I think that I spent a large part of my 20s 20s trying to figure out where I was supposed to land. I worked as a social media manager, project manager for a number of years. I ghost wrote content for other people. And then in between that was traveling and trying to find out where I was supposed to be. And so, yeah, it was an interesting time, but a confusing one. Did you feel that way in your 20s? Yeah, I definitely did. Well, I got married and divorced in my 20s. I so. mean, that's <laughs> how to how to use a decade. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like I went in and out. It's a full experience. Yeah. I always say, I went to Harvard for life, Mm. which is what that marriage like pivot of my life because I was four and a half, five years, total of seven. So it's like I did my what is it? Your Your, prerequisites. And then then I went and graduated. Uh, Then you did your capstone. Yeah, you did your undergrad. You did your Mm, English and your science. I graduated with a bachelor's. Didn't make it to a (laughs) master's degree, but it's okay. No, but you graduated with honors, I heard. So yeah, a little magna cum laude, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So I did that. And I think that for me, I could not relate to 97 
seven percent of my friends because i never had the college experience i didn't really care for it because growing up in miami you see a lot very early on yeah i would imagine and by the time you're 18 you're like "Mm," you either get kind of stuck in that lifestyle Mm -hmm. or you want to experience the college which is like a different element of miami or just Um, something completely different or something completely different and when i got the opportunity at 18 to move to la and start a business and all this stuff i was like i'm gonna take that route yeah but i didn't realize it was also gonna be so career and Mm. so much responsibility on myself like intensively like millions of dollars and all this stuff where Mm -hmm. you're just like where is this going i remember teaching myself quickbooks through google right for example (laughs) and none of my friends like could really they weren't in that space yeah Yeah. they they were like oh yeah i have a 25 page paper due and i was just like 25 page paper the last time i wrote that was like my senior year in high school i can't think of that but in the same time i had like 3.5 million dollars worth of investment that somebody's like okay so when are we getting our money back you know (laughs) you're like it's a coming it's to come right. and yeah so it's like that was very different for me and i think also like internally mm. i was a young woman and now i was handling this business without a college degree trying to continuously tell myself i am worthy to be here and i mm. really can take this role and become something out of it without the school knowledge or the degree to have that yeah absolutely but that sounds like a really good time in life to go ahead and deal with that imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. right you know because it's like you're doing it you're living it but then because you've seen the ways that other people land into careers you're like now wait did i skip a step that everybody else is going to come back and go now where's your piece of paper right (laughs) you know like i would imagine that that absolutely would be something to navigate but then did you feel like moving out of that time because look navigate getting that and then like you've said the marriage and divorce like that's so much that's like yeah. those are 40s problems in my mind you know what I'm saying like no, I remember coming out at 25 and being like I'm a 52 year old woman with three kids but I actually have no kids mm. and I'm actually 25 like did you ever kind of lose sight of your age while ghost writing for other mm-hmm. people and kind of like living your life for others because it seemed like yeah. that's what you were doing a lot yeah, at that time rather than mm-hmm. like discovering yourself yeah oh yeah oh I definitely did and I think that I spent a lot of time because I think that just a little bit of background I grew up in Texas mm-hmm. and I was plugged in a large church and thought that that's kind of where I was supposed to be but then would spend my weekends out on the road or would spend a chunk of time and then I'd have to come back and the truth is is that I realized that I was definitely offloading a lot of me figuring out who I was Mm -hmm. to find myself valuable where I was, if that makes sense. I exchanged, I think, a lot of having to sort out for myself where I wanted to go and who I wanted to be in exchange for, and in part with my upbringing, the noble thing of giving your life to another and laying it down so that you can serve another person. And so that was definitely a part of me, but it also caused me to grow up Mm -hmm. way quicker than I feel like, not that I was supposed to, but I was at 19 and 20 just because of the way life was. I felt like I was giving counsel to a lot of people who were older than me. And because of the industries where kind of my friends and my life reaches, it was a lot of areas that kind of felt a lot bigger than me. And Mm -hmm. I felt like it kind of forced me to put on a different mindset where I really didn't have to deal with me, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. No, and I I can relate to that a lot, too, because I remember having a business in my 20s and people constantly being like, wait, you're only 21, Mm -hmm. you're only 22, because I seemed so much older because I had so much responsibility so people would come to me a lot for advice as well Mm -hmm. and like guidance on even how to lead their companies or what they should do in life (laughs) and I was like I don't even know what I'm doing I know yeah you're like I'm still trying to figure (laughs) me out yeah of course I'm like I just learned QuickBooks two nights ago and now you're (laughs) asking me how I should like start a business we're figuring it out we yeah let's learn together and I think there's beauty in that I have a little sister and I Mm. always tell her she's so dramatic but then I bring it back to like wait I think I was probably dramatic in my own way at that time too oh sure yeah you know because in that time you just think just like in high school you think the world is crumbling oh and if this one thing doesn't work out like then i have to scrap everything i've ever touched exactly and And i think even more if i use her as a reference with being in school she's so studious and so smart Mm. but when something doesn't go her way and she's killed herself studying and all this stuff she's like that's it i'm a failure And in same but different, I would feel that way at times. You know, like even though I was helping run a company, when something didn't go right, could have been the smallest thing. 
I was just so hard on myself then mm. to be like, that's it. Like, everybody's going to hate me. This is going to fail. Like, what did I think? So much of the wow, imposter yeah. syndrome and like the negative self-talk would happen where now I'm like, the world is an undine. Like, it's not that I don't care as much now, mm -hmm. but I think now I'm like, okay, this was a bad day. This was a bad moment. This was a bad experience. The world isn't over. Yeah, well, you take a moment in context of the whole as opposed to like judging the whole by a moment, mm -hmm. right? I think that's maturity, though, too. Yeah. And also, I think not even just in your 20s, but when you're in it, it's a lot harder unless you train your brain to mm -hmm. see outside of it. Oh, yeah. You can't see the forest from yeah. the trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of my, in talking to even people in their 20s or younger people, I mean, look, I'm only 34, guys. I'm a spring chicken over here. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, there is a real overwhelm, I think, yeah. that can happen when you feel as if you're having to respond to everything happening to you and you're just living in that reaction kind of phase. Mm -hmm. And I think that your 20s are spent reacting because you're also getting on your feet for the first time, right? right. And so a 60-year-old is going to navigate a problem different than a 17-year-old mm -hmm. will, right? And a 17-year-old might be like, the sky is falling right now, but the 62-year-old is like, okay, so actually, the sky isn't falling. It feels like it does. This is just what's happening in this environment. I can separate that from the whole reality. And it's environmental and right. circumstantial. You had to grow up quicker Very because right. of your own reasons. I had to grow up quickly outside of all that that I just mentioned for different reasons, right? Do you think you were mature in certain aspects of you, but really immature still in others, though? Of course. Like, what was the Yeah, I was really, balance? really, really great. People skills, I can handle people, not to be like, I'm great with everybody, but like I can deal with people and do that well. My insecurity and lack of just being able to be in my skin and not mm -hmm. feel like my first objective is making you comfortable with being in my skin. Okay. Does that make sense? So do you think in your 20s you were more of a people pleaser? Yeah, I definitely was. When I left high school and I was a theater kid and when I left high school, it was almost like a dissemination of all of my friend group kind of at that point. And I was really desperate for some friends. And so I immediately found some older friends that were willing to pour into me like 10 years older and to mm -hmm. this day one of my very best friends a guy named Ryan Edgar came alongside and it was like I hadn't spent the time to really be okay with myself and I had never really felt wholly accepted just as a whole package of mm -hmm. Kavanaugh and when I found people who were willing to be like oh no I love you I felt like I was slowly able to start coming out of my shell and yeah. define the things that people would be drawn to about me but then I really focused on those things mm -hmm. so it would be like if I had affirmation from my older friends who I respected. I'm a youngest sibling, so there's also, I think, that at play. But it would be like looking for the affirmation from the people I respected to go, oh, I want to hear what you have to say, Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then that makes me really take into account what I'm speaking to and where I'm giving my opinions if you come to respect my opinions, right? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, Kavanaugh, that was funny. Okay, well, you think that's funny? Well, now I'll show you what's really funny in this area. Mm -hmm. and, it, well, and it makes you more comfortable with yourself to be able to show those sides of yourself to other people around you. Yeah, right? because it's still in my control, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really, I think, what a lot of comfort is based on is yeah. like, what feels like I'm controlling what I'm giving? What feels like it's being taken from me without my consent? As a person, there's that exchange. I think that in my 20s, I found what other people could connect with me on. And because as a kid and growing up, I kind of felt a little starved for like real heart connection. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I can reach people this way. Amazing. But that kind of put me on the back burner. And right. then I think I looked up probably around like 28, 29, 30 and was like, oh, mm -hmm. I've really offloaded a lot of figuring out who I am to just being present for other people. Yeah. And that's cool. Right. There's some, I think, good things in that. But now I have to take responsibility for like what I want to leave in the world, what I want to pour in. And I feel like it was a different question than I was asking in my 20s. In my 20s, I was like, I've got to get into something. I have yeah. to find my calling. And now in my 30s, I'm like, what am I actually called to? Right. I don't feel like I have to sort out everything I'm doing. It's like, okay, let's look at life. Let's look at what's in my hands. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the opportunities in front of me. And then let, then let me decide where I want to steward and invest, yeah. right? It's a uh, different You said thing. something about in your 20s, which reminded me of myself, that mm. I recently had a conversation with someone. In my 20s, it was so much of me pouring to people, but pouring from a large pot. Yeah. I'm very much a pictures person when I explain things. And in my 20s, I wasn't like here you go from the cup <laughs> you're like I throwing like, it here you go. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. sometimes people would be like whoa so much love so much attention so much time mm -hmm. or they would be like 
give it to me, give it to me. That's just how Yanina yes. is. And then I would constantly realize that I would deal with situation of friendships, work, where I would overextend myself so easily without realizing I was doing it in hopes that you can validate me because I didn't grow up having validation, but I grew up in dance and band, which mm. means when you do good, you win awards. Right, exactly. So I did that in my 20s of, okay, I don't have really a huge family support to lean on. I had a partner, then didn't have a partner. So if I just pour from a pot, mm. that means I'm going to receive from a pot yeah. where it was like, Arr! That's no, not the way that that's goes. not the way it goes at all. And sometimes it's a little bit repulsive for people to receive. Mm. But also that doesn't mean that one others give love that way or are going to know how to love you. Because yep. in that I'm not helping teach people how to love me or how to give me love mm -hmm. of service. Right. But instead I'm giving them so much of me that they're having to digest it and be like, do I even want to receive this? Right. Yeah. And that's a, that's, yeah. that's a whole So whether thing. it's like leaning on to them for a friendship when they were okay with just being like social buddies mm -hmm. or overextending myself with work and not working hard to prove myself in the company, but working hard to the point that now everyone's giving me their task and now I'm feeling burnt out. Yeah. I'm feeling not validated because they're just like, Yanina just likes to work. I'm not feeling like anybody values my work because they're like, ah, oh, she just does it all the time. And then in friendships, I'm constantly showing up for people that are not even asking me to show up mm. for them. And then I'm wondering why I feel alone. Yeah. And I think that it took the end of my 20s, beginning of my 30s to realize there is this woman. Her name is Verne Myers. She's an amazing woman. She used to be the head of inclusion of Netflix. And she said something in a podcast once and she reiterated in a personal conversation that she said all relationships should have reciprocity mm -hmm. and she said because the reality is just like a bank account each human has a soul mm -hmm. if you are doing more withdrawals than deposits or if you are doing more deposits than withdrawals it's gonna eventually be full on that side and empty on this side or you're gonna be negative on this side because you're giving to so many other people and not it's realizing and even if you want to fill yourself back up the reality is human is for connection. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I remember that it hit. And it was funny because the reason why she told me that is because it was one of my through divorce jobs. I became her personal assistant when okay. she moved to L.A. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I remember the jobs that I did for her were so small to mm -hmm. her expand of career that she has. But the amount of knowledge and wisdom that I would learn from her yeah. was so valuable to mm -hmm. me. So I love that. And now it's not about what can you do for me? Yeah. It's more if you care about me, you're going to make sure that we're both meeting at each other, whether that be, you know, in relationships, you have yeah, touches, right? Yeah, two-way street. Yeah. You said so many great things there. It takes me to, not to plug a resource, but I'm like, I have a book that's out called Read the Room and a podcast of the same name. And this is really like the area that I love to swim in and talk to people about. And you referenced relational bank account that mm -hmm. you have between people. And I actually talk about it in my book as a bank account because the phrase that I would use is relational equity, right? Mm -hmm. I ask you a question about you. You ask a question about me. We are investing that equity in a moment. If I only ever show up in your life to take, you're going to recognize me as a taker. If I am looking at you to complete something in me, then I can end up using my gifts, which I would give away. And as you say, yes, it is pouring from a pitcher. The way that we care about other people, it's a finite resource. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for for it to be infinite and for us to endlessly live our days out just being about other people. But that's not reality. Right. But we can be oriented to a way to look for people with glasses to fill. Mm -hmm. And we can be positioned to thoughtfully engage and to thoughtfully invest. And when you talk about the reciprocity, it's like a symbiotic relationship, right? If you were to talk about a tick and a dog, that is a parasitic relationship where one is winning and the other is clearly losing. And a symbiotic friendship, a relationship in general, is where you're literally looking from a vantage point of how can I support, how can I meet you where you're at? And that really is a perspective thing. It's yeah. not even about moving the abacus and being like, okay, so you did the 
these three things and I've done these three things. I think there's such a fine line. And I think that when I've talked to certain people in the past and they didn't like me using the word of like withdrawal and deposits, Mm -hmm. they see it instantly as like, but that's not a natural forming relationship. And I said, well, no, it is because there is such a thin line of strategy and having a relationship with strategy and having a relationship with respect Mm. and mutual respect. And I think when you have mutual respect for someone, I may ask you a question and you may be open and tell me something really traumatic about your life and I may not be there and that's fine Mm -hmm. but me listening and just like letting you into things that I am comfortable is enough of a deposit with time and I think that a lot of the times too in my 20s there were so many cups that were willing to receive and to give but what I didn't realize is that they had holes in them Mm. And I was like, but why does this person seem such like a fun time? Like they like me. Mm -hmm. They like spending time with me. We joke. We have fun. We have great conversations. But I always feel empty afterwards. Mm. And it's like cups with holes that you don't realize at the time unless they're going to go and put a little cement to cover it. Mm -hmm you're going to feel like you're going to be noticing more and more circles in them. Yeah. But you're also going to be drained every single time. And maybe it's because I'm the oldest. So I'm more of like a figure out the situation and protect this person that I back then would want to be like, they need love. Right, right, right. But I think up to some point, it's like they need love. Yes. And you can love them from afar. You can love them with boundaries. You can. Absolutely. Boundaries. Oh, boundaries that's a, a whole other thing. That I did not know existed when I was in my 20s. Ooh, but, so good. But also don't forget to love yourself mm-hmm. and to protect how loving and caring and how much time you are to put into things that you care about. But it's also find what you can give away easy in relationship. Mm-hmm. Like I talk about it in language of like, what's your renewable resource? Mm. Like I have an ability probably even when I'm not feeling it to walk into a room and find a joke and make a laugh like and bring a little bit of levity to a thing that's something I can give away to people that doesn't make me feel depleted in the end now I really do walk with people in life and I can talk through the deepest thing or the most fun kind of thing but my ability to sit with someone and really go into their life and really work through all of those things or meet them in that place that's not for everyone and I don't now live feeling pulled by my ability to meet people where they are and to feel like I have to meet every single person. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I can meet people where they are, but then it's also for me to decide what I'm willing to give away. And I think that that transition, not even from 20s to 30s, but just into maturity is where you're actually clear about what you're confident and willing to give away and that isn't going to cost or deplete you. Because when you're giving like relationship and you're giving friendship or love or encouragement or resource, whatever that is, from a place of, okay, now I'm ready too. You're always going to be disappointed, Mm -hmm. right? You have to get to a point to where you're like, I'm willing to give this away and I don't care if you ever look back over your shoulder because it's just who I am. Yeah. And I have a conversation with friends about that every so often because they're like, but you have the ability to just, I'm a very open book Mm -hmm. and I have the ability to share people experiences of mine. And I have a gift to tell you a lot without telling you actually much of anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why? It's because certain things I'm not attached to anymore. Mm-hmm. So I don't mind sharing this with you. And if the moment presents itself and I feel it in my heart to share it, I will because yeah. it might be helping you. But people are like, why did you just share that with that person? You don't know them that well. Or like, what if they say something? I was like, that's on them. Yeah, but that's also and- so healthy on your part yeah. to understand that there's no power and like nobody can use your story against you. I mean, growing up in the church, like I lived with that fear my whole life and like what can be weaponized Mm -hmm. and when you're willing to sit with every bit of yourself and go this is who I am then you're also willing to sit with the things that other people can disagree with and go yeah but it's who I am There's this quote I heard the other day on a reel on Instagram, and it said, the moment that you release a secret, the weight of it is no longer there. Yeah, of course. And it's like, if you're able to live honestly and genuinely, then who are you to say that I'm living something else? Because when you Mm -hmm. say it, I'll never forget a pastor told me this once. They said, if I looked at you and I said, you look like a dolphin, you're going to laugh at me. Because you don't look like like a dolphin. Of course, yeah. And he's like, so why are you believing when people are saying certain things about you that Mm. aren't true? But in my 20s, and even before my 20s, like in my teen years, I used to spend so much time trying to prove to people the idea of me that you have is Mm. wrong. But it's like, you guys are calling me dolphins, thinking I'm a dolphin, thinking I sound like a dolphin, I smell like a dolphin, Mm -hmm. I feel like a dolphin. I'm not a dolphin. Right, right. 
So yeah. why am I letting it affect me? But in our 20s, I feel like we don't know ourselves entirely, but we want to tell the world that we do. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, because I mean, I feel like every decade could be a version of this. Mm-hmm. But it's like when you're in high school, you want to be in your 20s. And then you get in your 20s and you're like, oh, this is fun. And then you're like, when I get to 30, it's going to calm down. <laughs> or no, I was terrified of 30. Oh, were you really? Yeah. Oh, you see, I felt like I've always been meaning to be in my 30s. I oh think that God. this is like my era. <laughs> when people would be like, wait until you hit 30s, you're going to love it. Wait until you hit 30s. I was like, oh, this is so annoying. These girls. I was like, this, <laughs> like these lies. girls are so annoying. They're so like dumb. Like they're just saying they. Oh, I'm gonna get older. The moment I want to say I got like 29, almost 30, mm. I just didn't care anymore. Mm. I was like, I care. I don't care enough to have to prove to you. Anything. Yeah. Because I like there was just like an assuredness within myself that started growing that mm-hmm. in the last two years grew even more. That you can't tell me about myself. Yeah, I'm at a great place to get to. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like, you can't tell me about myself. It's like, no, actually, you can't tell me about myself. Yeah, and I don't even have to tell you that out loud. No, and I don't have to explain it. I mean, you talk about boundaries, but I'm like, you don't have to explain it. That's the way boundaries should be. I think Mm -hmm. sometimes we think like, I'm changing my life and I'm adding all these boundaries and let me bring my family and friends and everyone in between to come in and get the new list of how I'm going to be. And it's like, nah, just do it. Yeah. (laughs) I will say, though, I think that people nowadays confuse a lot boundaries with avoidancy. Oh, yeah. There is a very thin line. And not to say that when you create a boundary with someone doesn't mean that you avoid the problem and ignore them or like cast them out or whatever it is. Because I think that in your 20s, you can go through that in your 30s, 40s, 50s, where you should implement boundaries. But that does not mean there doesn't deserve a conversation or, hey, this doesn't serve me anymore. Yeah, of course. Um, I think still right now, obviously, we're in the we're talking about the 20s, but still now I notice that some people are not comfortable with talking about emotions Mm -hmm. and they will just avoid it and then they'll be like the type of people that post about boundaries and this (laughs) and that and i'm like that's not boundaries though you're avoiding right well very avoidant yeah but that's i mean not to be this is going to sound condescending but if you're conflating the two just look them up they're just very quite different (laughs) Right. Like, like boundaries are to set some healthy parameters in place so that you mm-hmm. can deal with the whole of a thing in a healthy way. Right. As opposed to just saying, oh, no, 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 I don't talk about those things. That's my boundary. It's not a boundary. That's a wall. Yeah. Like very, very different. When do you think in your 20s you started like shifting your perception of self where you're like, huh, maybe it is going to get a little bit better and I'm not going <laughs> to feel so lost or confused. Yeah. I think that it was trying to bring my like worlds together. And I mean, to be honest, it was career stuff and it was about getting really settled in my trajectory. And my work life consists of a lot of things and it's more than podcast and the production and that side of things. And that I write, you know, that have the book, mm-hmm. but then I also coach and consult businesses on relational health and how they function and then individuals too. And I I don't think that I saw a space for that or a place for me to be the entirety of who I was and how I do relationship. And to your point, you know, my animated nature and gregariousness or how direct I can be at certain points. Like I didn't see a space for that. I think that I had to legitimately let my view of what I thought my life was going to be die, which sounds so sad. And it's really not. It's just that when you're growing up, it's really easy to set some like really defined things on this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. And I was raised in an environment where you kind of set your trajectory and walk it out. Yeah. And life did not work out that cleanly for me. But then in the midst of it, I felt like I was having to be a steward of my environment and where I Mm -hmm. felt like I was being led, which, to be honest, was California and had been for a long time. And I knew that I was supposed to be out here. But like, I think accepting that and letting the idea of, you know, I thought I was going to be a worship pastor for a long time. I thought that I was going to genuinely be in a ministry and the truth is is like that's not my life and I think that was put on me in large part and so I think it took a long time for me as I think if you were to interview a lot of people who come from maybe a similar background it takes a little bit longer to kind of go oh this is who I am and I'm okay yeah and I think and this is not to sound repetitive to what people have told me growing up but I now understand it Mm -hmm. when they were like you really don't know what your life is gonna go until you start getting an idea like in your late 20s, yeah, yeah. early 30s, but true, you though. really don't know no until clue. you're in your mid 30s. And I'm not even in my mid 30s yet. So I don't know where my life is going when mm-hmm. people are like, oh, you're doing this and you're doing that. And like, 
where do you want to go in five years? Now my answer is wherever God wants to take me. And yeah. they're like, wait, what? You're so career oriented and you're so focused and you're so driven. And I'm like, yeah, but we never really know where mm -hmm. the world is going to take us. And things can change in a year. An opportunity can open. Yeah. And out of nowhere, that shifts my whole life. Like, God forbid something happens. And now I'm having to take care of things differently. I'm like, you know, I can I can be married with a kid in a year and a half. But to me, that's nimble. That to me is like living on the balls of your feet, ready to move. And I think that not to be like every person who has a similar trajectory or where you and I, you know, have kind of come together on the like, it wasn't what I saw. So I had to go and yeah. build it basically and figure it out kind of maybe a little bit of the harder way. It's not, I don't know, there's not a direct path to like really getting and knowing exactly what you're supposed to do until I think you start walking in a direction. Yeah. But I also think I wish I truly, truly trusted and like, okay, Susie May said it and you know, I'm really going to trust her and like calm down take my the anxiety. pressure off yeah. yeah because the amount of debilitating anxiety and yeah. passion like even panic attacks that i would go through in my 20s when i would have 20 cents to my name oh yeah or when a job would be like we decided to go with someone else or when i got divorced and then i was like well, what am i gonna do like isn't the plan you get out of school you go into <laughs> yeah. college yeah. you find a partner you get married i was thinking i was gonna have kids in two to three years like yeah, now i have to take another lap what are we right, talking about like, what is dating which mm -hmm. dating sucks but yeah it's about the, don't even <laughs> <laughs> i'm like it's dirty out here but <laughs> yeah but i'm like wait so what do i do and i'm like well i got on the train first and i was leading it mm. and now my friends are in the back of the train with their partners and i'm getting off of it it's like so that's so real what, what train Oof. am i gonna get on now and, and, and is so there a real. train for me like what's going on you know and then the same thing goes for career because it's great for my best friend she's a teacher so mm. her career has always been and you go to school, you do this, you get a career yeah. and a grade, and then you move up. She wants to be a principal. She's doing her master's now. But I was the wild child that dropped out of college, oh, yeah. decided to start a business. Oh, then what's she going to do? What's she right, going to do? I was in modeling. I went mm -hmm. to school for broadcast journalism. Now I'm tapping into hosting. Every day I'm going into buildings for them to tell me you're not good enough. And then I'm right. trying again tomorrow. And then I'm now putting myself on social media only for people to comment <laughs> negative things if they feel like it because mm -hmm. they feel big enough to do right, it. Right, yeah. And then I'm still creating the content, hoping that the people that do like it, like it. But if it does nothing and I put so many hours into it, it's like, OK, oh, well, <laughs> you know, and I'm just like going with the flow, trying. And there's like a drive and an exhilaration from this, but also a debilitating like, what are you doing? Yeah. And somehow in between both of those in my 20s, I remember so vividly driving down Lancashire, passing Universal Studios and calling my best friend Jessica. And I was 25, 26. And I was like, what am I doing? Mm. Is it time for me to go back to Miami? And, you know, now looking back at it, if it would have came to it, it would have been OK. But something in me is like, you can make it happen. And I made it happen, whether it was extra work, a few positions of being different people's assistants mm -hmm. through throughout the same season, whether it was getting a temp job in an insurance company yeah. that no one knew. Like I always you made it, it work. Out. But in that time, I was just like, what timeline am I on? Right. Because I just felt like somebody came over and grabbed an eraser and erased it from my life. And I was like, and said, start over. And I was like, yeah. how? Where do I start? And then I have other friends around me that were starting to get married. Some were starting to plan kids. Some already had kids. Some were like, I'm about to graduate and get my first job where I'm finally making good, good money. Right. And I was like, <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And I think that even if you didn't go through a marriage divorce or leaving a company or whatever, you're in school and maybe you're not financially well. Don't compare yourself to the Kylie Jenners of the world. Not oh, everyone goodness. is a billionaire at 18 or at 22 years old. And thank goodness. Yeah. Because I would probably <laughs> do the same as Justin when he was 18. Yeah. I'd buy a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Let me buy it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I always thank God because I always say that God only gives you what you can handle. And even mm. when things are bad, God is giving it to you because you're either going to be a lesson to someone in the future or it's going to shape sharpen something in your life in that moment. Yeah. And I remember when I was in music, I used to tell a group of producers they would work so hard and they were so much success. And they were like, man, but we're working with this person and that person and the studio's booked out and we're getting these top 20, top 50 hits, but we still haven't gotten like the top number one. And they were all a collective and they all were actively in different parts of their lives at the mm, time. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were all in our 20s. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I was like 18, 19. And I remember being in the studio and telling one of them, I was like, the way I see it is, you know, when you're doing like track 
and there's the baton relay yeah. race or whatever. At the end of it, the last person is running and that's the one that rips off the ribbon, right? And I was like, well, I feel like since you guys are a collective and you guys all pass each other the baton, you guys all have to actively work with internally. Mm. And when you guys are good internally, spiritually, physically, mentally, and have battled with the things that you're battling right now that you're either avoiding or feeding mm. into, mm -hmm. that last person that was supposed to get the baton is going to break the ribbon. And I remember a few years after knowing that they were all in tune in the yeah. places that they were supposed to be. They were heading in that and direction. And then it happened. And I was like, the ribbon broke. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing for everybody. We all have different timelines. We all have different paths. And mm -hmm. even another example is my friend, she used to have a athletic line, an mm -hmm. old friend of mine. And I used to help her with it. And she was so scared on the launch of it because she was like, what if it doesn't do well? Or da -da -da -da. And I said, you cannot compare your success to somebody else's. Your brand can launch and it can take three years, 10 years, 15 years to hit. Yeah. But it could have a livelihood of 125 years of a career. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if the brand can live. I was like, this person's brand can go and sell out. And within two months, they lost passion for it. Mm -hmm. So it's like the biggest thing that I wish I would have told myself is stop comparing yourself yes, in my 20s. Yeah, so good. Because have to. I wasn't even comparing myself to the Kylie Jenners. I was comparing myself to me. Yeah, which to is the idea of who so I was funny. supposed to be. Yeah, and you're, and it's not even a real thing, mm -hmm. but it's what you've made. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, taking off comparison is, I think, one of the more freeing things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even it's like living in LA and pursuing ventures. I mean, I'm sure like all of our friends are doing a million different things. And at any point, you could look at one person and go, "Oh boy, okay, I'm behind." Or you could look at the mirror and be like, "Now wait, we told ourselves that three years ago we were." going to have a house at this point and we were going to be doing this thing comparing yourself to that mm -hmm. idealized or that idyllic version of yourself and then when you actually just take the pressure off yeah and allow yourself to just even i know that this sounds like so silly but i really am so big right now on getting out of a reacting to whatever you're in and getting into a response thing and so i was such a bad reaction <laughs> well then let's I talk still, about I it i still work on it but yeah, but even reacting to, it's like that judgment that you would place on yourself is yeah. a quick judgment. It's a reactive judgment, right? Yeah. And so if you're dealing with this, like let's say you're in your 20s right now and you're playing that comparison game to talk to it mm -hmm. and to literally, I call it like turning on the lights. It's like, okay, so deal with that fear. So-and-so is doing whatever, or I should have been doing this at this point. Okay, so I'm not doing this thing at this point. But who set the standard and who set the template? And then when you find out it's literally all been you holding your own neck up against the wall. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then if you're a faith person and you love the Lord, I'm like, that's when you go, hey, Lord, can you help take my hand off my throat? Yeah. And the Lord will go, cool. Thank you. I've been waiting for you to ask me to do right. that because like these four things that you said are you, I'd never put on you. Mm -hmm. And this thing that that other person said, I mean, the amount, I know all of us have this, but the amount of things that a leader could say, that an ex could say, that someone we respect, a pastor, whomever, can like mark your life. And I think that even taking the power hour away from that and going, no, again, I'm not trying to make this like a preaching thing, but I'm like, talk to the Lord. Right. Because so many times people will put on you what has never been put on you by God. Yeah. You either put on yourself limiting beliefs or you allow others to put them onto you. And at the end of the day, when you step aside and try to get to know your deepest self and all the versions of yourself mm -hmm. and be able to allow them to live simultaneously, the yeah. one that doesn't know what's going on, the one that's a little scared and yes. you can hug and say, it's okay. Yeah. The one that is like, I need to be strong. And you're like, hey, calm down. You don't yeah. have to be strong. Uh -huh. You can walk with it. You can even have a little shiver with it. Yep. But just keep saying good things are going to come and walk with faith, walk with love, walk with peace, knowing that you're trying your hardest. A little tear here and there. Don't hurt nobody. You got to no. water the plants. So, you know. You need to. You need to. <laughs> I think about it in this way, too. The psychologist that I adore, Dr. Andy Arbor, he describes this thing, and I've worked with him for a couple of years and just love him outside of his work. But what he would say to that is, no, you have to invite every part of yourself to the table. Mm -hmm. And every part gets a seat at the table. And I think in your 20s is when you meet all the versions of yourself. I didn't until my 30s. Really? I don't I think I addressed like, oh, I understand. I don't think you know how to work through them yeah. until your 30s. Yeah, but I feel like I, 
it was probably, yeah, yeah maybe I started seeing everyone at the yeah. table, if that makes sense. But it's like, I'm such a visual thinker Same. too. So it's like when I would do these initial things, because a fear of rejection for me, that has been the biggest thing. And I battled depression for a great number of years. And that's why you don't give yourself away without, not even give yourself away, but that's why you don't give yourself out of health. Yeah. Like you give yourself from a healthy place, but not searching for it. Right. right. But I remember I felt like anything I did was going to be rejected before I even put my hand down to start the thing. Right. And that really just kept me stuck. I felt mm -hmm. like for a couple of years. And then I was able to like actually look at that part of myself like it was around a table. And I remember Andy was like, hey, so let's talk about this because I want you to see everybody at the table who's at the table right now. And I start describing because I'm genuinely like mm -hmm. saying I'm like, oh, there's my host loving side who's like running around and taking care of everybody at the table. And then this is my like war don't mess with me side over here who's like sitting in the middle just watching not even eating not drinking just surveying that's my side that feels hyper vigilant like I've got to make sure everything's good and then I saw like four rows down a little kid who was hunkered over the table and who wouldn't even lift his hand to like reach for a plate to reach for anything and my heart broke for him and I really love people y'all I genuinely do and so I was like this kid and I forgot like even the exercise that I was supposed to be talking to myself and I was heartbroken for this kid and Andy was like okay so who is that and I was like oh that's me as a kid and that's when I got stuck mm -hmm. with this leader who made me feel so shamed for having this thought and so the hopeful dreaming side of me doesn't even want to lift its hand because I already feel like I've been shut down. How old were you when you had this conversation? This was a few years ago. Yeah, <laughs> so like, like 30. When you said that, it resonated a lot with me because I think that in a big portion of my 20s, I thought because of career and I just got like sulked into that world of mm -hmm. like career and go, go, go. I was in a relationship and everything. I forgot to take with me and to heal little Yanina. Ah, uh, yeah. And yep. then when something traumatic happened in my life again at 25, I was like, oh, so now I'm hurting. And I'm looking back and I was like, oh, wait, and you've been crying yeah, this whole time. Yeah. And I was like, oh, so I abandoned a part of myself. Yeah. And yeah. in abandoning a part of myself that was younger, I realized that now I have two versions of myself that are broken. Mm. And I was like, and they're walking with you into every room you go. Yeah. And I was like, now I have this woman that doesn't want to be bitter. She's just heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah. And she's and, tired. And she's tired. She's tired of being the tough cookie. Yeah, Cause yeah. that was another thing. Everybody around me would always be like, you're such a tough cookie, tough cookie, or you're always perfect to the point that in my twenties, I started growing up with hating Yeah. when someone would be like, you look so perfect to me in my brain. It was a negative word right? because I was like, I am far from perfect. Why do you guys keep saying that? Mm. But it was because I was feeling her, but not nurturing her. Mm. And everybody was just like, you have it put together. Mm. You look so well put together. You're always doing this. You're always doing that. You always figure this out. You always figure that out. You always show up for this person. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm avoiding her. Mm. And now I'm realizing this one is also now sad. And I think it took me to be like, like you said, who is all sitting at the table? And who have I avoided and instead need to not only talk to and heal, mm. but also take with me and be okay with it. I go on walks sometimes with my friend Yusef and I change like my tone whenever I'm talking here and there about a story. And he's like, so which one is here? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's now a joke. But the other day he wrote to me and he was like, do you want to go for a walk? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you or your 45 personalities. I was like, 45s are coming with me. You know, yeah, every one of them's going to yeah. be in tow. So no, so it's, it's so good to deal with that. I could talk about this stuff for a long time. You could be listening and be like, this is so weird that like they're <laughs> talking to parts of themselves. And that's fine. You can think that. But I learned wit. I learned language really in high school because I had like bully things when I was a theater kid and it doesn't take long to figure out that math of like what was going on. But I learned how to be so razor sharp and laser pointed with what I said that it was like I moved from being in a defensive posture to offensive. It was mm. like I became so aggressive in having to put 
people down in a room to the point to where like by the time I graduated high school, I would walk in the first day of class. And if that teacher was giving like <laughs> less than kind vibes, I would directly address that. If there was someone in the room that I felt like was going to be mean, I would put them down before they even had an opportunity. And it was horrible. Yeah. It was like a really, really aggressive, aggressive way to live. And I remember when I graduated high school, having literally a moment of just going like, it's time to take our fists and unball them mm -hmm. and actually learn what it means to live life with others. But then in a part of this dealing with your parts thing was that like, I fully realized that like, there's still this warlike thing that's just ready to like knock you down. Mm -hmm. And someone who's verbally like always ready to go like, oh, what? Okay, let's talk about this, 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 this. And the truth is, is that like, like I had never dealt with that side of me that felt like they had to defend and protect me because I didn't feel like necessarily adults saw or protected me in the way that I needed to. Mm. And when I was able to look at that version of myself and go, you don't have to fight anymore. And when I was, again, looking at people, it was like I saw this like woman at the table who like literally had this like blood spattered like war. It was like she was an ancient fighter or something. Oh, yeah. And then she had this sword strapped across her chest. Oh, and they I all don't look like you? No, uh-uh. Oh, my no, that's, look like me. No, because it was like being able to identify very clearly different parts parts of myself and how they function together. Mm -hmm. And so it was like my defense and my protectiveness that's a very real part of me had turned so unhealthy because I had never gone back and told myself, hey, we don't have to fight anymore. Mm -hmm. You can just be now. And actually people can be unkind and that doesn't mean that your response has to be in the same. Right. And that doesn't mean that you have to put others down or try to check somebody before they can get to you. You don't have to hide anymore. <laughs> you mm -hmm. don't have to like live with your fist up. And it was a legitimate healing moment for me to look around that that table and because I felt like those two parts were the things that were keeping me stuck was that I had this insecure I can't accept where I'm going and what's for me and then I had this thing that was ready to deck you yeah the second you crossed me and it was like being able to look at them out from outside of myself and isn't that crazy I feel like so many times myself and even like a few people that I've come across I'm like you don't even know how much you're blocking from your life because mm. you're so scared to either sit at the table or turn around and look at the mirror for a yeah, second yeah 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 and it's not in a judgmental way it's more in a it makes me sad when i see how much people are caring because they don't want to sit down for a second and be right. like let me have a conversation with this other side of me and you're a man and i think yeah. it happens a lot with men with men of color it happens a lot with women latinas mm -hmm. specifically and different types of minorities and we're similarly different in that we all want to appear like we have it all together we want to appear that we're either happy we want to appear that we're financially stable we mm. want to appear that we're cool we want to appear that you're not going to mess with me we always want to appear like something rather than just being yes yeah. and if we're just be people i can see you and i can know that you have a funny side i know that you have an emotional side mm. i know that you're about business i can see all this surrounded mm. around your head mm -hmm. right yeah, figuratively yeah. and i can take you and that's fine but if you were always just like this closed right, right. off and just like very direct and very short just one angle of that right, yeah to me i'd be like what is he hiding right yeah and i feel like people probably see that in at least i know that people saw that in me when i was mm. in my 20s and now i also see it in other people even past their 20s because the one thing that i will say is that it is hard to sit down or to look in the mirror. Oh, yeah. But it's also so gratifying once you do it. Oh, it's healing. I think if you wanted to like do some self-work and maybe this is with a therapist or a psychologist or someone who you just really respect and you appreciate the way they walk, it's like sitting down and actually allowing yourself to be settled enough to see every bit of you and to know that it's not going to kill you actually positions you to be able to carry more, mm -hmm. to be able to meet the kind of people that you actually want to do life with in a holistic healthy way it also gives people a real direct way to respect you mm -hmm. because no different than you said that's kind for you to say that about me but I'm like the people I really respect are the ones who I feel sit completely autonomous in who they are and who aren't looking for me to affirm confirm <laughs> like add to they just are mm -hmm. and so even in their insufficiencies they are wholly more than enough mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying they're aware of the yes. things that they can't meet you at yes and they're okay with that exactly you know i think for me like i craved love mm. so much from a home yeah that I would overly love people and then be so confused as why to they're why. not loving. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. And then I was like, well, two things, Yanina. One, you're loving people that are identical to the type of person that you didn't receive uh, love from. Yeah. And then two, you're also loving people that haven't even, one, gotten to that level with you yet, mm. but also didn't ask for it. Yeah. So a therapist once told me, your relationships in life are like an onion. There's mm -hmm. different layers to it. Totally. And sometimes you may be placing somebody in layer two. This is a layer five. Yeah, or level yeah. seven. Yeah. It's a social friend. Totally. I tell this to my sister all the time. And it's okay. Can we but please But in my dig 20s, everybody oh, would no, Everybody two. has to be the best friend. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. I could talk for a whole hour about that. But relationships to me are rings on a tree. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, not everybody is called to walk at the same level. And the second that you can get comfortable not being everybody's number one, number two, number three, then you'll also get comfortable with allowing them to not feel like they have to fulfill any spots. Yeah. Nobody likes pressure in friendship yeah. or like they have to come to the table and and be exactly who they were yesterday. And my like, be you know, quote unquote, best friends, I'm like, we're in our 30s now, but it's like, my best friends, we ebb and flow of like, mm -hmm. closeness. And there might be a month where I'm with one person three or four times a week, and then another two months where we're not talking so much, or this one friend who I see every six months for coffee, yeah. they all have an equal valued place in your life, if yeah. you can see them as actually different. Mm -hmm. And whenever you actually look at your own parts, and are able to recognize the differences, you'll be able to look at the people in your life yeah. and be able to recognize the seats they hold at your table. And that's why also it's okay for the place that they hold in your life to change or evolve. Yes. And even the people to. Yeah, absolutely. Because at times you might be in a really toxic like environment and you meet this person and you guys are like bonding, but you're trauma bonding. Right. <laughs> it's and not healthy you're, and yeah. you're codependent and now. And out of nowhere you started going yeah. to therapy and then you're like hanging out with this person and you're like, why do I feel different every time I'm mm -hmm. around this person? Or, or heavy. Why are we still talking about the same things? Yep. And it's okay. Everybody has their own journey. Everybody learns in their own time. Some yeah. people don't choose to learn, but you know, everybody <laughs> <laughs> But we hope, we hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody learns in their own time. And at that point, it's it's okay to shift and move and it's kind of like a, a Rubik's Cube yeah. where you're just maneuvering it and it all encompasses in getting to know yourself better. Yeah, it does. And you don't have to be overwhelmed by that. And I love what you had said earlier, even about timelines. And I realized this got deep. But the truth is, is that it really is a self-determined timeline in that, like, the more you're willing to dig into yourself and don't become self-obsessed and consumed because right. that's unhealthy in a whole different way. But I'm like, the second you're actually willing to attend to the things in your life that you know, because we all know, we do genuinely know. I'm like, mm -hmm. it might take a therapist to go, now, what'd you just say? And did you hear that? But we genuinely know our kind of main sticking points. Yeah. And I think that once you're willing to look at them in the face and go okay, this is what it is, then you're actually like piece by piece starting to gain more and more of a backbone, more of those shoulders spread out wide. In your 20s, I feel like you walk around either like frantic, this like, ra -ta -ta, where do I need to be and what do I need to do? Or you walk around like, oh, I'm just trudging and I'm just trying to figure it out. And it's like, I lived my 20s, I feel like head hung over, like wandering. It was like, okay, I can do this. I have this to give. I have this to pour out, but I don't even know. And I wish that I had taken some time in my 20s to like still myself in the middle of doing college and in the middle of working and all of those other things like actually tend to what I knew I needed to mm -hmm. because I feel like it can save some time. Yeah, I think for me, I always say I'm grateful for my mid twenties crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Felt yeah, like I yeah. went through a midlife crisis. Your but quarter like, life crisis. Yeah, there I you went go. through my quarter life crisis, yeah. and even though it genuinely flipped my life upside down, mm -hmm. it forced me to be like, you can either go the this route which can be avoidant, mm. push down emotions and just keep head on strong. Or you can go this route of be honest with yourself, sit with yourself, rediscover yourself, who you truly yeah, yeah. are and who you truly want to be. And then meet all the levels of yourself that you've let behind in the past and that are going to come and then walk with calmness and assurance that there is a purpose for you. Yes. And I started walking yeah. with that even when things went wrong and little by little as I've gotten older when things go wrong they don't affect me as intensely as they did when it was in my 20s Yeah, because you've learned how to carry it exactly yeah. and it's like does it get lighter I think it does and mm. it gets lighter because you start understanding it better yes that life then, is not meant to be perfect no you're not supposed to have it figured it out in your 20s you might not even have it figured out in your 30s right. and that's okay because
because your journey is your journey. Your process is your process. Now, if you decide to hide and lie, you're doing the biggest disservice to yourself. It's true. It's but true. and everybody else around you. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. you know that's but then an option you're gonna end too. Up alone because uh, yeah. they're all going to leave you. It's true. And to be honest, not to like round it out in any kind of sad way, but I'm like truly deal with yourself. Yeah. Because I've watched it too many times where people get in 50s and 60s even yeah. and have no friends because yeah. they have not learned how to meet other people. Or you realize that all these years you have so many still in your 50s and 60s people around you that are only with you because of the benefit that you give them. Yeah. And you're still yeah. living exhausted. Yeah. I mean, there are people like as a kid growing up in the church, it's like there are so many mothers I think of and who basically burn the candle at both ends because they feel almost like that is the job. And mm -hmm. Then if that person doesn't learn how to go, oh, no, actually, that's not like my mode. That's something I can do, but that's not who I am. There's always, and I say always because I feel like it isn't always a stop point where that person has a realization of like, now, wait a second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the anger and then the resentment and the bitterness of what you've given away and didn't realize you gave away comes back. And so and it's like, like a lot of people talk about it in the what if when it comes to career. Yeah. But like it's what if towards self yeah like what if you finally realized that you didn't want to open this box of forgiveness you didn't want mm. to open this box of let me process the things i've avoided the things i've pushed aside and now you're in your 60s yeah and yeah. you're like oh i guess i'll go through it now but it sucks that i'm going through it now it's like Same. i oh, think i oof. i decided yeah. to go through it most of it in my 20s mm -hmm. and it helped develop me so much more yeah and yeah I love it. I love it now. I hated my 20s, personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love where I am now. Yeah, and I didn't I love, love them either. I love that, like, even though dating still sucks, just like it did in the 20s. <laughs> true, true. I feel like I'm okay with it. And I'm, like, more at calmness and peace of, like, it just sucks. And my person is out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really not about to do all the mayhem to find it. I know it's going to come to me as long as I do my part. And as long as I'm walking in faith, as I'm walking in purpose, it's it's going to happen. And call me delusional, but Delulu is the way to go for me. Listen, I don't think it's delusional. I think that you're like, my trajectory is set here. Yeah. So I'm going to find somebody who's along this path. And I mean, that too is like when it comes to self-work and understanding all of this, it's like, who do you want to be surrounded by? Like mm -hmm. people who haven't dealt with their childhood trauma or those who are adult and who have dealt with it and can deal with you holistically and your trauma no different than they've dealt with their own. It's like right. nobody actually wants to be surrounded by incredibly unhealthy people, even though that's where we gravitate. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to save yourself just relational mayhem down the road, it's like, go ahead and deal with yourself. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it would also help in relationships. I mean, to be determined for me, but I'm like, I think that it genuinely <laughs> I mean, will. same. I'm like <laughs> single. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, deal with those things so that whenever somebody meets you along the way, you're not having to go, oh, now let me just pack up my closet real quick because well, I hadn't dealt with this. Right. And that's what I was going to say. Like, I'm nowhere near perfect. And I'm aware of that. But I'm aware of what I am and yeah. the things that I'm still working on. And I think there's so much beauty in that because when I do find that person, I'm not having to go and be like, well, there's a few boxes over here in this closet that I've never mm -hmm. gone through. Instead, I'm like, hey, there's a few things that I've laid out, but I got rid of most. And I think that's the beauty of everything. You're not supposed to expect to meet somebody and they're perfect. That doesn't exist. No. Eventually, you're going to figure it out where this perfect person is. Mm -hmm. And shambled. then they'll fall off the pedestal on their own. So if you've listened to this, and I'm sorry to hijack you, Nina, but <laughs> if you've listened to this and you're someone who is finding yourself at a crossroads where you're trying to figure out where you're going and what you want it to look like and maybe who you want to do life alongside you, I'd say the first thing is, is to find Find somebody who you really respect, who you could possibly process a little bit with. Someone who you can say, hey, I feel like, you know, maybe there's this little rejection thing I'm dealing with, or maybe there's a, a fear of failure that I'm dealing with, like I talked about, or rejection. Find you a safe person. And that's not everybody, okay? So find yourself a safe person. I'm not talking about finding a whole community of people that you can pour your heart out to, but find one safe person. If you're at a point in life where you have some processing that you'd like to do, I know Yanine is a big fan of journaling and I am too. I think it's a great way to see your thoughts out on paper and to be able to see them clearly and be able mm -hmm. to dissect a bit. Yes. And then the last thing I'd say is to just get active. And I mean by that, if there is a passion, if there's something that you love that you are drawn to and want to pursue, take 
a step in that direction. For me, songwriting was really where I kind of got started in my 20s. And so for me, that looked like asking my friends who were up and coming songwriters or maybe a little bit further along songwriters, mm -hmm. hey, is there a way that I can sit in in a writing session or throw you a lyric idea or a top line melody that maybe you could write to? But if you can activate in like your actual life with something that you can see a step forward, if you can bring somebody else into that dark part of your life and allow them to speak life or encouragement into it. And then if you can spend some time with yourself, you'll already be putting yourself in line to be able to see really who you are for a holistic level. Yeah. And I would to add to your part one, the really important person in your life, I would say should be a therapist or someone older than you. Yeah. Don't you know, find a peer. Yeah. A peer. They're going through the same things as you right now, whether they want to admit it or not, they might have some wisdom in them, but it's always better. Like you said earlier that you hung out with people 10 years older and actually too, yeah. until the last three to four years, all my friends were all 10 years older than you. Right. Yeah. Because you just learn so much from them and you are able to talk to them in a way where it's not judgmental to what you're currently going through because they've already passed it and experienced it. Mm -hmm. And then another thing too is when it comes to the exercise, the hobby that you were mentioning, mm -hmm. try out classes. Oh, try, yeah. out, try out classes. Try something new every month. You're in such an experimental time of your life. Trying out new hobbies, mm -hmm. cooking classes, yes, pottery please. classes, like social classes. If your biggest thing is that you don't have friends right now or anybody that you relate to, go to things that you want to try. You will meet people mm -hmm. that have the same interest as you you cannot try to tell someone to go put on a heel when everybody around you is wearing sneakers right, horrible right. example but you get it you know like I'm not <laughs> i just, like that i like the so example. it's like go <laughs> if if you're really into art and nobody around you is into art start taking art classes yeah because you're stuck or you're great those are the same things that you guys are into you're gonna meet someone true. there that's gonna be like hey my name is bobby what's uh -huh. your name yeah. might not be the first class might not be the third class but you will eventually find that and then you'll find your group when i was 18 I didn't have like musician friends but the truth is is that I wanted to be in music and I was singing and I was writing and so it was like oh my first friend I found who did that a little bit I was like Oh, incredible. I found somebody who's walking in a similar direction. And then if you steward that, then it leads you to your people. But you're right. I Definitely intergenerational relationships are so important. That's another thing. If I look at your social group and it's all people your age who look like you, sound like you, think like you, let's widen that out. Right. You know, mm -hmm. let's get some wisdom in there. Let's get some years in there. Don't be the smartest person in the room. No. And chances are that would be hard for any of us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be. <laughs> well, I hope you guys laughed a little, enjoyed learned a lot and got anything to go to continue your day with this message and if you are in your 20s give yourself a break mm -hmm. please nobody has it figured out not even in their 30s so thank you so much for joining me on this episode thank you for having me this is so fun and i hope you guys enjoyed it till next time